It's okay? All right. Um, I base this off of my experience in training people for the uh, last five, eight years. I've trained about 20 odd people from time to time. Um, some bits of it work quite well. I've been quite successful in training people how to understand and interpret what they see on the network. Some bits not so well. I've had uh, very little luck at training people to stay loyal to the university when somebody offers them three times as much money. And absolutely no luck in training them to not call me up after they leave and tell me how much more they're making than I am. So, you know, you take what little victories you can get. My name is Miles Johnson. I've done IT security for USU for the last 15 years. I've done general purpose miscellaneous role IT for USU for about 35 years now. Um, years ago, we saw an interesting presentation on this thing called network logging uh, in Salt Lake City. Um, and we said, oh, cool, we should try that. Um, it worked out quite well for us, and now uh, analyzing net flows is an essential part of our uh, security toolbox. Uh, let me begin this presentation with just a couple of simple questions to help me calibrate uh, uh, what you expect. How many of you have enough experience with NetFlow to spot my obvious lies and fabrications? Okay, good, good, good. How many of you are gullible fools who will believe everything I say? Excellent. This is going to be a very productive presentation. Um, the, uh, unfortunately, it's the other category we need to develop. It's why you look at NetFlow. It uh, comes when you're going to stop believing what everybody tells you and start gathering evidence and try to interpret it for yourself. Uh, the latest version of this presentation and all of the presentation materials are in the conference materials. Uh, I keep updating this and using this in my own training, uh, and the, uh, all the materials that I use in my own training is available at that URL there. Uh, if you want to get a lot out of this presentation, uh, go to that URL and just follow there. Almost everything I say is going to be in that uh, URL, plus all of the NetFlow files are there. You can just pull them up and look at them. And when I get to the second half of the presentation, I'm just going to go there and start following the links and showing you the data there. This is a screenshot of my work desktop. I'm always using a number of network monitoring tools simultaneously. I found that network activity is convoluted and hard to understand, but it gets a lot easier if you can get multiple angles, multiple perspectives on the same events. Uh, the more different viewpoints you can get, the easier it is to form the mental map, to wrap your head around it, and to understand exactly what happened. The tools that are shown in this slide are the USU Connection Visualizer. Uh, that's a tool we created at USU. It's open source, GPL. Uh, you can learn about it by doing a Google search for USU Visualizer. That'll take you to some uh, YouTube videos and, and to the uh, Git repository where you can fetch it. Uh, also using Snort here, I'm looking at some NetFlow logs and a Wireshark. Basically, I would use all those tools simultaneously to look at the same events. Uh, each tool does something slightly different. Uh, similarly, in your strategy for understanding and managing your network, you shouldn't get dependent on just one tool. NetFlow is really neat. I can do all kinds of things with it, but I'm an idiot if I think that that's the tool I can the only tool I use to manage my network. Um, there's basically three approaches to tracking past network activity. The first is 
uh, record it all, do full packet capture. If we need to review it, we'll then subject it to various forms of interpretation, and we can keep reinterpreting the data until we arrive at what we need to know. Uh, second, uh, well, tools that do that are things like Wireshark, um, Security Onion, a uh, whole bunch of commercial ones. do in those connections, but they're very interested in where you connect to, who you talk to, how long you do it, what you pay attention to. Uh, the third approach, then, is the, um, ah, wrong button. Uh, the third approach, then, is the, um, let's just sample an occasional event from time to time. And then, if something goes wrong, we'll check there and see if we get, if we manage to capture it. Um, sampling's cheap; it's easy, but you miss very many, very many important events. So, in summary, if you were rich, you'd do full packet capture, and you would hire a team to interpret the full packet capture for you. If you're poor, you do sampling, and then after you have a disaster, you uh, dig through the sampling to see if maybe there was some evidence of what went wrong there. Uh, NetFlow is a compromise. It's not as good as full packet capture, but it's way better in sampling. With it, you can get some guidance, some help, and a uh, pretty good diagnostic view of who talked to what and when. In order to set up one of these projects and have it work, you've got to start with a good foundation. Uh, over the past 25 years, we've had we've experimented a, with a bunch of monitoring tools. Sometimes we asked for help and advice, but most of the time we didn't. And sometimes we were successful, but most of the time we weren't. Which leaves me with the bitter realization that I really should have asked for more help and talked to more people when I was setting up my security monitoring. <laughs> I kind of suggest you guys do the same, even though it's not what I did. My uh, uh, monitoring looks an awful lot like that. Uh, secondly, uh, monitoring people, monitoring networks, is a very uh, tightly scrutinized process. There are lots of limits and expectations on it. Most monitoring, uh, well, most of you work for larger organizations and you already have built in process and expectations for your behavior. So, for almost all of us, that means before we can get anything done on a monitoring and a liking project, we have to create supporting policy. Even if you are a small organization, if you create the supporting policy, it will pay off to you immensely. You'll spend a couple of days, maybe a week or two, uh, on the supporting policy. It's faster the smaller your organization, but it will save you months and years in the long run. Now, uh, here's an example of the USU policy that enables our network monitoring and vulnerability, vulnerability scanning, if you want to pull it up and for comparison. USU is different from many businesses. Some of you have functional top-down management. I wonder what that looks like. USU is more of an anarcho-syndicalist commune. That is, in order to get anything done, we just kind of gather around and we talk at each other. And then we talk some more, and then somebody gets frustrated and does something, and then we argue about what they should have done, what they didn't do, what they ought to do. And then uh, if it works out, we say, oh, well, I was in favor of that all the time, which is, you know, our normal business process. And it works for universities, but that's crappy if you're a business. Um, that said, even if you're a business, it really helps if you inform your community, if you let them know what you intend to do, if you let them know what your limits are, what you'll do and what you won't do. 
uh, for us, we created some YouTube videos that described our process, our intent, our limits. We also documented all of our processes and made them available to our community on our security wiki pages. And here's links to all that stuff we created for our community. Most of us are geeks. Uh, we don't usually talk to anybody. But again, after 35 years of this, I've found the life gets better if I actually talk to my management once in a while. Um, I need to tell them what I'm doing. I need to keep them apprised of my progress. I need to give them options. They are oh so happy when they have options. And then I have to let them understand the costs and benefits because they'll always go for the dumbest, I mean, the most expensive, least effective option, inevitably, unless I help them understand the benefits and understand the costs. And then you have to let them pick an option and then you have to live with it. But, yeah, and it sounds like a royal pain, but afterwards you end up with things like salary increases and uh, continued employment and uh, somebody who will back you in your efforts to shape your organization from where it is to where it needs to be. Anyway, this here is uh, our latest briefing document for USUIP management. And it's a briefing document on what our current options are moving forward in monitoring and logging. Finally, you get down to designing your monitoring infrastructure, and it will have holes and it won't be perfect, but you, <laughs> it's your architecture, and you just need to own it. It may not amount to a hill of beans, but this is your hill, these are your beans. Uh, it will have gaps, but they're your gaps. Be proud of your designs. You may not be able to cover everything, but you can document the hell out of it. And that's just good practice for security, and it uh, helps us understand what we have, what we don't have, what it will do, what it won't do. Usually the most important bit is knowing what your tools won't do. Wikipedia has a good article on NetFlow. It's worth reading. This image is from that article. The image is essentially uh, uh, what I would have drawn if I was drawing our current monitoring infrastructure. Uh, our most important NetFlow probe that generates the NetFlow data is at our border. And then we have secondary probes that are important points within our network, and all those probes generate data and forward it to a central collector. Then we run reports and automated alerts on the central collector. Uh, the way that NetFlow gives you its big advantage, which is uh, ease of use, is that this data while being bo is both easier to understand than the raw data, and it's small. Uh, we get a thousand to one uh, work advantage off of generating work uh, NetFlow versus full packet capture. and get another five or six to one compression, which means that we can keep a year or two worth of logs around. Uh, and they're fairly comprehensive of all of our data. There are lots of solutions available for individual NetFlow components. Some NetFlow solutions are commercial, many of them are. If you just Google NetFlow solutions, you'll find lots of people willing to sell you something at a wide variety of prices from um, $1,000 up to $100,000. Uh, many of the solutions are free. For example, most Linux distributions have free software in them that will create a NetFlow probe. And they also have free software in them that will create a NetFlow collector. And they have free software and then that will generate reports. And us being a university and dirt cheap, that's what the past we essentially followed. But we did use a bunch of very useful software, very good software from the NTOP people uh, as uh, part of our project. Um, 
first we've got a link here to the NTOC people and the software we use there. Secondly is our implementation notes on how we set up our network monitoring, uh, our NetFlow stuff. Uh, we've actually, um, as an experiment, uh, looked to see if we could create an N, uh, NetFlow probe using a Raspberry Pi. And it worked great. It's a Raspbian. It's about a dozen commands uh, at the root prompt to install the packages and configure them. A $15 USB to e gigabit Ethernet connector. And it actually works up to 20, 30,000 packets per second. Um, of course, that's not enough for any of our uh, business links, uh, but it's plenty for a small business. It's plenty for a home network if you wanted to try that at home. Um, if you come to this, eventually I'll have links to that project and how to configure a Raspberry Pi to do that, but right now it's not there. But that's on my to-do list. I've got the finished project sitting on my desk. Okay, second half of this exercise is a bunch of um, NetFlow files that I just point to and say, and, and e, various uh, useful and very informative uh, descriptions. If you're completely new to NetFlow, it won't make much sense to you. But uh, just keep at it. Everything, every bit of experience you get helps. Uh, if you spend some time in another um, uh, exercise working with Wireshark, that will help you understand and interpret this stuff. If you um, spend some time um, with almost any network-related activity, did I say NetShark? What a weird thing to say. Any network-related activity, that will help you understand NetFlow because it all ties together in a Zen kind of way. Uh, it's all connected to the greater whole, which is the activity of your network. And the more you look at it, the more you practice it, the more you work at it, the more it makes sense. Uh, in my training of people, uh, it takes about a full month for them to become quite proficient at NetFlow. And they have to look at flow files for um, half an hour or so, uh, two, three times a week. So that's about the time commitment. But uh, you have to do it. If you do it some this month, do it some two months, you'll have to keep redoing what you've learned. It won't really add. Uh, the exercises I've got here, again, are available at that URL. They're available online. They're part of my own training. There's 19 of these little exercises. You can come back and look at them later. Uh, we'll have time during this presentation to look at uh, maybe three or four of them. When we get to the index on the next slide, take a look-see. Uh, because this is an intro thing, I'll just be starting at the beginning working through. But if you see something that's particularly interesting in there, uh, flag me down after I've done the first couple and we'll jump to that one. So, oh, no index. Oh, great. Um, first one of these exercises. Um, I gathered some information on connections to an inactive IP address. That's fairly simple. Uh, this IP address hasn't been used for 10 years. There shouldn't be traffic to it. The traffic that gets there to it probably is all abusive. Um, in this uh, exercise, we've got four files. There's a histogram, which I generate off the flow files. Uh, it's an hourly histogram that shows how much. flow files is in the resource directory in the conference materials. Uh, there's a report logs, which is auditing information we use internally to see who generated which flow and when they did it. There's the flow report, which we generated, and then the analysis, my analysis of the flow report. Make you with the oh good. Let's just swing over and over here. Cool. 
somewhat readable, but jump it a bit. That should be somewhat readable. And uh, it's going off the edges, so um, excuse me for a minute whilst I adjust my accoutrements. Let's see, I think we've got everything on the screen there. So, here we go. Here's the histogram to start with. Uh, the, um, you may not realize this is odd, but the odd thing here is that the amount of traffic to this inactive IP is fairly invariant across the course of the day. That is, uh, the same amount arrives almost every time of the day and night, which is odd. I don't really know why. Now there's that report logs file, and now we're to the data. Let's adjust that again. There we go. And don't you wish you were sitting on the front row so you could see that? Flow data is a interpolation. It's not reality. It's a, gosh, it's an abstraction. It's, you know, what if we could uh, take the underlying reality, which is these packets going back and forth, and create an abstraction saying that every time a packet went by, it was related to the concept of a connection. And then we could say, Somebody connected to somebody rather than just packets went by. That's what flow data is all about. Sometimes it closely reflects the underlying reality, which it does with TCP connections and many UDP connections. Sometimes it's completely misleading, as when you're looking at flow data on a multicast stream of packets. Um, the underlying abstraction was created, I think, back. 20, 30 years ago, somebody uh, said this network thing needs a supporting economic model. Hey, let's do it like the phone system and we'll bill everybody for every connection. And in order to do that, we need to have logs with the connections. And Cisco was a young, agile company back then, so they threw it together a couple days later and we've got flow data ever since. Uh, the point is, is that it's uh, it's an abstraction, it's not the reality. You've always got to bear in mind that this isn't the reality. Flow data also has some other limits. Um, one of the biggest of them is that the data sometimes can be misleading in ways that you don't really understand until you've been, I don't know where the heck the mouse going in. It for a while. So, for example, in all flow data, it says that there's a duration. But then frequently you'll see several flow lines for the same connection. Well, what does duration mean then? It's meaningless. Um, this flow file here, this flow data here, is a simplified form of flow data that we use at USU. It's because we started with the more complex flow report and then we started removing the things that either we didn't use or that was misleading to us. Uh, if I had to, to do over again, I would completely remove the duration field as well as the other field that we removed. Because sometimes it's meaningful, but more often than not, it, it, it lies to me. Plus, it takes up space. And it... Uh, distracts my eyes when I'm looking at stuff. Uh, so anyway, um, for the rest of this presentation, I'm going to talk about this as if things really happened as continuous connections on the internet, and this really was a representation of them. But you've got to realize that it's not really true. You'll see multiple flow lines for the same connection that happens all the time. You'll, you'll look at flow reports. Data will be dropped missing 
That happens from time to time. You look at a time stamp and you say, this happened then. Uh, well, we tightly synchronize our entire flow system using NTP. The clocks on those systems are, are, are accurate within a few uh, nanoseconds, but the flow reporting system has never been accurate to within uh, a millisecond or so. So the timestamps are quite, uh, quite, well, quite inaccurate. And uh, millisecond doesn't seem like much to normal humans, but we computer people know that. At gigahertz speed, you get millions of events in a millisecond. Uh, it, uh, a lot can happen in a millisecond. Uh, also, flow report data gets reported out of order all the time as it traverses from the probes to the collector. So sometimes you'll get data about an event that's not where you expect it to be. In most of these exercises, I've sorted the data by the timestamp in order to try to get all the information together in one place. And, and you'll need to make that part of your routine when you look at this stuff. Okay, so this is an inactive IP. It's seen mostly attack traffic. Uh, if you look at it, the, uh, uh, the attacks start uh, four minutes after midnight. They go on most all the day. Mm. Come on, you mouse. Why do I keep turning that off? What can I do? There we go. So. Just let that flow and not get too focused on the individual details. But you see, as time whizzed by, again, it looked like if you kind of watch the time stamp change, you can see a fairly uniform change in the minutes, a fairly uniform change in the hours. Again, the amount of attack over the course of the day is fairly invariant, which is odd. You think they focus on the time of day uh, when people are around. Um, also, the type of attack is fairly invariant here. Mostly piece incoming TCP connections consisting of a packet with the SIN flag set. That's what that S over there means on the right. Every so often, there's something else. The something else is uh, very... This is a, an attack packet. Uh, it's probing to see if there's a UDP-based DNS server. If there is, they would see a response. Uh, this and this are both what's termed backscatter. That is, somewhere out in the world, there's some poor sucker that's getting pounded with a denial of service attack. Uh, the attacker is spoofing uh, probably every IP address in the world, but in the process of doing that, they're spoofing USU IP addresses. And they send their attack packets to that poor victim, and the poor victim struggles to keep up and occasionally sends out a response to the attack packet. If they send the victim SIN packets, the, vic the victim will send out SIN ACK packets. And that, that those responses, the backscatter, don't go back to the attacker. Instead, they come to the people whose IP addresses were being spoofed. So by looking at backscatter, you can see that somebody's using our IP addresses in a part of the world where you can spoof uh, source addresses. You can also see who's being attacked. These people at 185.50. whatever have been under continuous attack now for several months, and we continue to see backscatter coming from those poor guys. Uh, let's move on to the next one. Uh, these get progressively a little bit more interesting, I think, uh, as you move through them. Back up. Okay, this next one is a flow report that's generated of data arriving at a range of inactive IP addresses. In this case, this range has been allocated to security again for almost a decade. 
we're not really sure why it draws so much traffic, but uh, we may be helped it along by giving every IP address in this range a DNS host name. And not just any DNS host name, we gave them names like controllers, backups, and alternate domain controller. Uh, we gave them names that suggested that this might be poorly managed IT infrastructure. <laughs> and uh, definitely some of these addresses in this range draw more attack than others. Uh, but the funniest thing is the address in here that, that's drawn the most attack for years was the one we called Hot Pants, which doesn't make any sense to me, but suggests that most of our attackers are male. Um, in this report, there's a lot of data. Each one of these individual IP addresses uh, both draws a lot of traffic and it has border firewall exceptions to let all that traffic through. Where normally we would throw away anything incoming to uh, ports that we don't want to protect, like 445, 135, unencrypted protocol. Here we let them on through. Um, let me scroll. Uh, also, here you can see that it starts a few minutes before midnight. Our collection collector closed out one day's worth of stuff, opened up the next day's worth of stuff promptly at midnight. But the support. Again, the flow data is, is poor in that way, is laggy, and you, you end up needing to sort it. But if I was looking at the tail end of yesterday for the data, it won't be where I expected. I needed to look in the next day because of that laggy nature of any flow generation system. Let's just scroll this quickly. Uh, this is one of the skills you actually have to learn, and I teach my people which is to just stare kind of at the center of the screen and watch the stuff go by to get an idea for its structure and how it changes over time. Um, eventually you end up trying to automate a lot of this and you end up needing to, um, you end up making automated reports, automated things that analyze this stuff for you, but you always come back to, did I miss something? Or am I truly correctly understanding what's there? And it always ends up staring at large piles of data. So you need to learn how to train your eyes to see this structure even as it goes by a high speed. And then when you see some kind of change in the structure, to back up and say, what the heck happened? It was doing one thing, it stopped for a minute or two or three, and then it started doing something else. Uh, to be able to see the discontinuities and the anomalies, even at high speed. Once you develop that thing, whenever your boss comes by you, let him see you paging through stuff at high speed and then stopping and saying, oh, there was one. And it impresses the hell out of him. So that's good for a few bucks on your summary. Uh, just pretend that you're that data character from Star Trek The Next Generation. That's, uh, that's the impression you're trying to give, and that's actually the skill you're trying to acquire. Um, in this data, uh, one, of the, one of the big tricks in analysis, any form of analysis, is teaching yourself to see what is in front of you, not what you expect. And then after you finally see what's in front of you, teaching yourself to always ask, what does this imply? Uh, two keys to analysis that you need to develop in yourself. Uh, one of the ways in order to see what's in front of you instead of what you think is in front of you is to start off by just asking yourself questions of the data. Any full file you look at, you should ask yourself questions. You should say, when did it start? Anchor that in your head. You should say, when did it end? Go down, anchor that in your head. You should say, who uh, is involved in this flow file? Who is it from? Who is it to? 
and then try to anchor that in your head. In this case, like I say, it's to a uh, dark range of IP addresses we use for uh, analysis of uh, background internet radiation. But who it's from is even more interesting. As you go through this, you find that there are patterns in the from, and otherwise, data looks otherwise uh, random. And <laughs> one of the first patterns that's been true for four or five years now is that all the addresses are Chinese. Uh, don't know about the rest of you, but uh, uh, a research university that does things like build satellites and clone animals draws intense attention from the Chinese government. Uh, we don't get so much really what you would call uh, intermittent uh, vulnerability assessments from them. We get a continuous vulnerability assessment that occurs every day and happens by uh, hundreds of machines and by uh, hundreds of different tools. Uh, if you can try to stay off the radar of the Chinese government, it's like being the object of a fox hunt. Anyway, um, other patterns in this data, well, the obvious ones is uh, there are periods of quiet where time goes by fairly quickly and the uh, connections are intermittent. Then there's periods of uh, very fast activity where uh, we have the start of something, what's it, it's at 3, 0144, the end of that something is down here at 0145 for a second, then a lot of stuff came through, and then it stops and goes back to the intermittent, and then a lot of stuff comes through, and then it stops and goes back to being the intermittent. So there's these intermittent high-speed scans that traverse our address space. Uh, we can count them in this sample and see that they're happening maybe every five minutes or so, or, or whatever it is. It's about every five minutes. Um, we can look to see what are the most attacked ports. Uh, it should be obvious to you that some ports have drawn some attention, more attention than others, but it's useful, uh, especially when a new one appears. So let's jump back up to the top of here and uh, say, uh, when did my attackers start scanning for port uh, UDP 22163? Uh, see if I've got some of that lying around, whatever it is. Uh, it may just be backscatter from a denial of service attack, or it might be yet another management protocol uh, run by some subset of equipment, and maybe I have some. Um, this stuff right here, 5351, UDP 5351, it started happening recently. Uh, it turns out to be a thing that you can use to vastly uh, expand a denial of service attack. Uh, we had three of them on campus. They were wide open. We didn't know that until we stopped, saw the incoming stuff looking, and we looked to see why were they standing for that. And, of course, you probably have a better managed network, but again, we're a university. We have uh, 10,000 people that believe they get their money directly from God and will spend it any way they want, uh, and which makes for a fair amount of chaos on our network, which we try to contain uh, and keep from destroying all the rest of you as best we can. Uh, well, let's uh, jump on to the next one. Oops. And jump down a bit. Uh, normal traffic to an SSH server. Anybody interested? Yeah, we'll move on. Uh, normal VNC traffic and web development. Now you can come back and review this if you want some calibration samples, what normal looks like. Uh, DNS denial of service attack. Okay, we'll look at that one. One day we. Uh, had some stuttering in our network, we weren't sure why, but when we eventually looked at it, we found that there were uh, these huge events. Uh, we seem to have taken them in our stride, but they were troubling. So here's a flow sample. It starts at 7.09 and 14 seconds. 
I'm going to start scrolling it fairly quickly. This is a flow sample of our normal external DNS server. So they're quite busy, and this flow file is quite large. Uh, but if you follow the time right here, you can see it's 70920, 709.30, 790.40s. Time is passing at a fairly uh, normal rate. And we're in 710, 20, 30. When we get to 711.03, which we haven't quite gotten to yet, 50. 11.02, 7.0, 11.03, then it sticks and it doesn't change anymore. That's when the denial service attack happened. Uh, there were a number of hosts, and you can see the hosts listed here. Uh, this one, this one, this one. A number of hosts that started asking us over and over again the same questions. So it was a standard, easy, simple denial of service where they simply tried to overload a, a, a normal service by doing too many requests against it. Um, and this lasted for about 10, 15 seconds. It bursted up from our normal traffic levels up to 2,000, 3,000 requests per second, and then it dropped down again. That traffic level wasn't enough to knock us off the air, but it was enough for us to sh scratch our heads and say, why? We didn't hurt anybody. We didn't say anything bad about the Chinese government. Honest. I swear. It wasn't us. Uh, why? Um, we never did find out an answer why, but, you know, we analyzed the hell out of this thing. Uh, we found that, um, let's see. Uh, here is how it changed over time. Here's some uh, sample command lines you can use in a Unix environment to uh, dump the flow report, grep out a sample of one second, and then count how many lines were in that second. So you can see how they changed from 16 connections, 15 connections, uh, then 180, uh, 1700, 2700, up to 11,000, 12,000. Uh, you can see how the number of connections changed over time. So, um, at the end of, in the resource materials for this, is a page, uh, a file called Useful Commands, which contains um, snippets of commands you can use if you're working in a, in a Linux or Unix environment or on an Apple uh, um, uh, OS X to analyze flow files. Uh, to pull out his pieces of them, to look for specific kinds of things, to look for where data comes from, to look for where data goes to, to look for what ports it happens on. Uh, snippets of all of those, examples of all of those is in that useful file. Um, here is how many robo clients then were connecting to our DNS servers again in various times. And 7, 11, and 0 seconds, we had seven remote clients. 7, 11, and 1 second, we had seven clients. Two seconds, it jumped up to 23. Three seconds, it jumped up to 31. Ten seconds into the denial of uh, service, it was only up to 59. It's discouraging to see how few uh, attackers it takes. can't ignore the thing. to say this thing's infested and make everybody leave, uh, everybody out of the swimming pool. Um, we call them love taps. I suppose you could call it pissing in the swimming pool. But um, We've had that pattern for years, but this didn't seem to be that because our, our DNS servers didn't seem to be uh, compromised 
uh, or doing anything unusual. We also got samples of the queries that they were asking for. They were uh, asking about normal USU things. Yeah, it's a mystery to us, and we're sending what was going on there. The next denial of service attack in here is a oh, classic DNS amplification uh, denial of service attack. Uh, so we've got an example of that for you to see. Um, the odd thing about this one is that it's uh, an oddly convenient denial of service attack. It's only 10 packets per second. It's against a box of ours that doesn't exist. It uses ports that are easy to block. Uh, it's like somebody's doing a denial of service attack just so that they could see that it works and so that they could let us know that it's possible, but we can easily and conveniently block it. The other odd thing is it's been running on change for 10 months now. Uh, I've asked around other institutions. It's the same denial of service attacks being seen at multiple universities. Uh, most of them are have low levels that don't bother them, but every so often one of them gets a level that knocks them off the air. We don't know why. Uh, uh, here's a um, histogram. We generate this as part of our processing, automated processing of flow reports. Uh, a packet per second and a data bytes per second. Um, here's the flow, actual flow. As you can see, these are responses from remote DNS servers. That is, somebody sent a query to a remote DNS server that where they spoofed the source address, they spoofed an address from USU, specifically they spoofed this non-existing address. And they asked about something large. All of these DNS servers are in China. They were asked about something in Baidu, which is a Chinese search engine, and that, that, uh, that uh, Baidu query generates a large response. So a classic uh, uh, DNS amplification. Um, other than that, there's not much to see here. As you can see, it uh, flows. Uh, oh, there's an interesting event. Oh, I guess that box does exist. Oh, that's right. I've got an example of a uh, full-blown comprehensive vulnerability assessment by uh, the Chinese government against this guy later in the, the examples. Um, anyway. But it doesn't uh, have anything on this board. Um, and like I say, it's been going on for months. It's like, and we see a lot of this, again, our special relationship with the Chinese government. They set up tools that they intend, just in case they ever need to use them against us. They set up denial of service conditions that they can trigger at a moment's notice. They set them up, test them, leave them kind of idling. They run vulnerability assessments against us in case we ever get really interested, interesting to them that they don't follow up on until they want to follow up. Um, odd things like that. Uh, Denial of service backscatter, you've already seen ping sweep, telnet scanning, SSH scanning. Uh, uh, we've got the time for one more. Um, Chinese vulnerability assessments, uh, persistent attacker, this is another one of those. Somebody has been doing comprehend doing vulnerability assessments against the critical infrastructure of most every university. Um, and of their most critical boxes for the last two months. Uh, they test 4,400 ports on those boxes. It's not the most vulnerable boxes at the institution. It's the boxes that are most critical to the functioning of the institution. I've asked around amongst my peers. Most all of them that have the ability to do analysis have seen these assessments running against them. Uh, they are investing huge amounts of money in doing these assessments, whoever the attacker is. They don't follow up on vulnerabilities they discover then. They're caching information.
activity. You find information, you store it away for later. Hmm. Um, maybe this one, a full-blown exploit. In this case, back in 2011, we had somebody that did a comprehensive vulnerability assessment of us. Uh, it a uh, fairly standard tool they used. It starts with a ping sweep, which you see in this uh, log segment. Goes on with a port scan, scanning for uh, each machine that responded to the ping. Hit them for 55, 550 ports. Uh, then, for every one of the ports that responded, they do or they run a bunch of tests to look for uh, vulnerabilities that they'd follow up on. And this is this is what that looks like: a bunch of tests. And then they eventually settled down on a single uh, box. So, as I've seen, we see a lot of these incoming from different parts of China. Uh, when we see one of them, we uh, evaluate that one and treat it as if it were an external penetration test. We might as well, we're getting raped either way. Uh, so we look at the results and see if they turn up something from an external point of view and using their uh, tools that we need to know about. And we look to see if they follow up on anything and if any of our boxes responded in anomalous ways. And it sounds stupider than all get at, but we might as well do it because it's happening anyway. And by doing that, we found all kinds of zero days and all kinds of vulnerabilities we, don't, we didn't know about. And we've managed to greatly improve our security posture. In the case of this one, they settled down on one box uh, that had a vulnerability. They found that vulnerability in about a 30 boxes across our campus. It was a weakness in the land desk management system. Land desk is a way of managing a bunch of uh, a bunch of computers. A weakness in the management system that allowed you to turn one of the land desk ser services into a proxy, so you could bounce off that service and then proxy to anywhere else. Uh, they took advantage of a single machine in our library. It was 2 a.m. after hours, no one was around. And they started using that machine to pull up research results that were only available to us in our library. They were interested in material silence and crystallography. Uh, it was New Year's Eve when they did this. Uh, so somebody in China had a pressing need to look up material science in 2011. And uh, they uh, gave us uh, what was essentially a zero-day exploit in order to look up the research result. Uh, well, we found it to be very interesting. Uh, probably uh, here are the kind of things that they were looking for: uh, uh, IBM sites looking at technology stuff, uh, uh, journal crystallography, a bunch of stuff from LexisNexis, and so on. They bypassed all kinds of resources that a normal hacker would have taken and cashed out in order to get to research. So, you know, it's a classic example of uh, what the Chinese government is after us for. Our relationship with them is quite unique. Uh, they don't try to destroy us. They treat us like a milk cow. And every so often they come around and they milk us. And then we try to keep them from controlling our every action, try to keep them out of our routing infrastructure, and keep them from disrupting our science and uh, the core missions of the university. Anyway, uh, there's 20 of these exercises. If you're interested in developing your skills in net flow analysis, just go to that web page, pull it up, uh, look at some of them. If you want to improve your abilities to do net flow, Start doing experiments with your own, on your own, or look at this stuff. Look at some every day, not for long, but a little bit. It's a matter of training your eyes and getting so that you blend this view of network traffic with the views you already have in your head from Wireshark and your other monitoring tools. And together you get a good, uh, a better, uh, never get a complete, but a better understanding of what you are, how your system works, how it's attacked, and how you can defend yourself. Any questions? Oh, thank you. Well, at least we're not throwing the rod in the